This video is made possible by our loyal Patreon supporters. Visit patreon.com. Hello, everybody. This is Abby tuning in. In this video today, we are working with beautiful Karina. And I would like to talk about the neck, the shoulders, and specifically the jaw. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. If you haven't already, follow us on social media for tips, tutorials, giveaways, and daily inspiration. If you haven't already, go check out our Patreon page where you can find more content just like this. So first, we're just checking in. Make sure I gather as much information as possible. This helps me understand the plan of our treatment a little better. It also gives Karina a chance to calm down and get in the zone. So the focus that I would like to mention in this video is a tension pattern Karina has on this left side. As you can see, when we rotate this way, there's ease, I'm not having to do much with my hands, a lot of give. But as I try and rotate to the right, I feel denser tissue underneath my fingers in this occipital area. And as you can see, there's not a lot of range of motion. This can be for a number of reasons. Sometimes injury can cause denser tissue or denser fascia, but a lot of the times, and I believe it's specifically with Karina, this is from a pattern. So the next phase in understanding this imbalance is to check in with these muscles here in the neck. We have the scalenes that run down the side. And then we also have the sternocleidomastoid, which comes down the front, right into here. So the right side has developed tissue over here as well. But right now I'm trying to focus on the imbalance. I'm trying to see if there's an opportunity for alignment. Another thing to pay attention to is the direction of her jaw. Even here we can see there's a little bit more of a rotation that makes this a shorter distance from the collarbone to jaw on this side than from this side. This pattern could potentially be seen throughout the whole upper body and I have seen it traveled down and into the lower body as well. If the spine is rotated to the left, then it can also show symptoms of rotation to the left all the way down. I 
noticing the medial rotation of this right shoulder. If the right shoulder seems to have a tendency to be shorter in this pec minor area and the pec major and its insertion. That's natural. Karina is right-handed. Therefore, she demands a lot of articulation from this right side. Perhaps there's more detail-oriented work with the right side, causing her to use the phalanges, the fingers a little more, which means it's important she's able to keep this area in the most efficient position. But in order to keep that position, the rest of the body must acclimate, compensate even. It's just one of the many versions of duality. <laughs> So the rest of the body has to compensate for these patterns. I can see on this left side, there's a little more width and distance from the beginning of the collarbone to this deltoid area. More than likely, the forward medial rotation of the right side is causing the left side to sit back a little bit. This is, um, this can be to help stabilize the body as she does her very important work with the right side. It's also like there's only so much tissue to go around. So if we use up the whole string over here, then this has to give a little bit. It doesn't mean there is not pain. A lot of the times the side that is sacrificed for our dominant side can be more painful, more prone to injury. Here, I'm providing a little bit of pressure for the shorter side and reintroducing that rotation, which we saw had limited mobility before. It's my way of saying, hey, we want you to have mobility here. And this may be a source of the challenge. This is a very intense hold sometimes, depending on what pressure you put down. But a lot of the times with the dominant side, this anterior deltoid can be hypertoned, a little overdeveloped and overworked, and therefore pretty sensitive. Uh, but as you can see, it's providing the length we're looking for. Be asking, how does this relate to the jaw? Uh, I would like to answer that question. As we're opening up these shoulders and trying to balance out the collarbones and subsequently the ribs underneath, we are also having to pay attention to the scalenes and the sternocleidomastoids, as I mentioned earlier. A lot of the times it's hard to know the difference between the scalenes and that lead into the traps, and really it's just like one big area of discomfort. <laughs> but if these 
high, uh, upper traps and scalenes are tight, then it can lead to tension and imbalance all the way up into the jaw and all the way up and into the scalp muscles as well. Already I can feel the tension and the pattern I've already seen here replicated in the temporal muscles and bone and lobe, even where her ears are sitting, back to where her jaw is sitting, back to where her shoulders are sitting, and I have a feeling down to where her hips are. We are a multi-sided species, so <laughs> as I get into the front, I like to come back into these traps and rhomboids and just make sure I'm gathering as much information and providing a little pressure in hopes, always in hopes of balance. Ooh. A lot of the times with jaw pain, especially from my personal experience, I remember just begging someone to dig into the jaw muscles. <laughs> it can provide a lot of relief, but only for a few moments, you know, not very lasting for me. What I find to be the most lasting is working on the source of the issue, which can either be what we're working on now the upper body and the structure and the fascial connection and position. Or it can also be from injury. Um, maybe injury to the cranium or any past impact on the nervous system it can also throw off the placement of the jaw as well. my go-to of traction. Traction is a wonderful way to help the body integrate new information, as well as a little bit of compression as well. Use your intuition. some of that mobility back. It's important to remember when you're rotating the neck, always listen to their limits. Lots of potential for error in those rotations if the body's not ready. Do some serious damage. <laughs> Next, I'm going to go specifically into the jaw, because if you are looking for some pressure in there to relieve the pain, it can be very helpful. Personally, I love to start in this lovely area right here. If you were to go and find your own temporal bone, you would most likely find this little ridge. It's a trigger point. But I enjoy working that area first because the muscles in the jaw are a little more vulnerable. There are glands and things like that in there. And usually if I've worked these temporal muscles a little bit, the jaw is more receptive. I don't have to go as deep. Simultaneously though, I'm feeling a lot of tension in her occipitals. So <clears throat> I'm feeding between 
some pressure in the temporal muscle and lobe, and then pressure and a little traction in that built up tissue in the back of the neck. Always gauge your pressure. And here I am actually going a little deep for her, but it can be intense. So make sure to tune in with your patient or the body that is receiving. Make sure they can handle it. So now we have that a little open. I'm going to come right in here to the jaw. I like doing both sides. It is a bilateral bone. And tuning into both sides at the same time can help me understand the imbalances a little more. I have to meet Karina where she's at. There's no forcing her into alignment. So the more I can understand about her misalignment, the smoother the transition can be for both of us. I'm not doing a lot of pressure here. I have a grasp on her occipitals per usual, and there's a bit of pressure there. Really, in the jaw, I'm just providing a little bit of compression, proprioception, and her system is telling me what she's ready for and what she's not. So we're finding a very tight source back here in the back of the neck, possibly an erector insertion around, I'd say, C3. As you can see, I'm feeding this work down as we go along. Personally, I feel if I'm pushing the fascial information down, it means I'm spreading out that spider web and creating more room for tissue work and change. We were right, this right trap, this right side, it's sourcing a lot of her imbalance. But that is to be expected. also a wonderful little tip. The first ribs are really right in here. So if you think about the rib cage in relationship to the collarbone, when this area up here and these ribs begin to um, traffic jam, I can put a lot of pressure on the tissue. And it's not the most efficient way to hold your body up. So neck pain, headaches, jaw pain, migraines, all these things can easily come from that. As well as a lot of compression on the brachial plexus, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful intersection of nerves that are right here in the front of the chest, the pecs. Compression on those nerves can cause neural pain, tingling, numbness, all the way down to your fingers. Okay. So thanks for watching this video today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please, we invite you to go and visit our Patreon page. And I would love to hear your comments, feedback, suggestions, and questions. I will see you again soon.
Introducing Yoga Plus, offering a free series every month with over 300 different videos. Take control of your health. Work out anytime, anywhere. Yoga Plus, download now for free.